So in today's video, I'm gonna take you through everything you need to know for mass transport in animals to smash the AQA A-level biology exams. I'll take you through hemoglobin, the oxygen dissociation curve, the structure of the heart, the circulatory system, and heart disease so that you can master this topic and get the best marks possible. So let's get into it guys, I'll see you in the video. So A-level biology, mass transport in animals. Now we've got the spec here and it shows that you need to know all about hemoglobin, you need to know about its role in terms of the transport of oxygen, all about loading, transport and unloading of oxygen, the oxygen dissociation curve, the Bohr effect, animals being adapted to their environment by possessing different types of hemoglobin, the general pattern of blood circulation in a mammal, you need to know about designing and carrying out investigations on pulse. You need to know about cardiac output, which is stroke volume times heart rate. Additionally, it's important to know the gross structure of the human heart, the structure of arteries, arterioles, and veins, the formation of tissue fluid, and also being able to interpret data, especially on things like the cardiac cycle and cardiovascular disease. And it's even got, in terms of mass transport in animals, a required practical, which is the dissection of animal or plant gas exchange systems. Now, this is fantastic. I really enjoy teaching this unit, so I hope you enjoy learning about it as well. Now, let's start with hemoglobin. Well, hemoglobin is a protein with a quaternary structure, and it's made up of four polypeptide chains, two alpha chains and two beta chains. Now, it contains a prosthetic group, which has got an iron ion at the center of each polypeptide chain. And it might be easier to write that as Fe2+. Hemoglobin can carry four oxygen molecules or eight oxygen atoms, and they associate with the iron ion, which is Fe2+. The prosthetic or heme group is what gives blood its red color. And high affinity hemoglobin associates with oxygen more readily and dissociates with oxygen less readily. Now associate kind of means to bind with oxygen, so the, the oxygen is associated with the Fe2+. Now, low affinity hemoglobin is the opposite, and that dissociates or unloads oxygen more readily. So this is hemoglobin here, and we can see we've got the beta chains at the top, and we've got those fantastic alpha chains at the bottom there, and we've got one, two, three, four polypeptide chains, each with their own heme group. So when hemoglobin associates with oxygen, it's known as oxyhemoglobin. Now, hemoglobin saturation next. So when hemoglobin has loaded oxygen or taken it up, the blood is now said to be saturated with oxygen. So if it's saturated, it's full of oxygen. Now, a high concentration of oxygen means a high partial pressure of oxygen. And the unit for partial pressure of oxygen is P. O2. You need to know that for AQA A-level biology. And a high concentration of carbon dioxide is a high partial pressure of carbon dioxide, which is given the value of PCO2. Now, hemoglobin is loaded with oxygen at the lungs, where there's a higher partial pressure of oxygen because we've just inhaled atmospheric air. So there's plenty of oxygen in it. And it's unloaded at the respiring tissues, such as the muscles. Now, these respiring tissues are going to be using oxygen for aerobic respiration. So, let's have a look at an oxygen dissociation curve. I always tell my students to sketch this, so you've got a really good idea of what this graph is all about. Now, on the y-axis, which is our dependent variable, the thing that's being measured, we have the oxygen saturation of hemoglobin. So, if we have 100% saturation, that means every single group, every single heme group, in every single molecule of hemoglobin in the blood is bound to an oxygen molecule. And I've got that here. So 100% saturation means that all hemoglobin molecules have four oxygen molecules loaded. So we can see here that the curve is sigmoid and we can see that it's less steep at the beginning, more steep in the middle and less steep at the end to the point that it pretty much plateaus. Now, when the first oxygen molecule binds to hemoglobin, this causes a conformational change in shape, making it easier, and be careful with that term because hemoglobin doesn't find things easy or difficult, 
but it makes it easier or more readily able for the next molecule of oxygen to bind. So this is why the curve gets steeper, which means that a lower change in partial pressure leads to a greater increase in oxygen saturation. Okay. Whereas at the beginning, we need a bigger change in partial pressure. So a greater increase in the concentration of oxygen to have that same increase in oxygen saturation. Now be careful not to say faster because we're not given time on this graph. And that's a common misconception I see. Now we've also got a unit here, which is kilopascals, and that's a measure of pressure. So when there is a high partial pressure of oxygen, hemoglobin has a high affinity for oxygen. This means it will readily associate or combine with that oxygen. And when there's a low partial pressure of oxygen, so a lower concentration, hemoglobin has a lower affinity for oxygen, meaning it will readily dissociate or release the oxygen. Low saturation means that less hemoglobin has loaded oxygen and a high saturation means that more hemoglobin has loaded oxygen. High and low affinity hemoglobin next of all. Well, we can see as the curve shifts to the right, that gives a reduced hemoglobin affinity for oxygen or a decreased affinity. If the curve shifts to the left, which we can see with the dotted line on the left here, that means hemoglobin has a higher affinity for oxygen. So basically, it needs a smaller change in partial pressure to get the same saturation of oxygen or the same increase in saturation of oxygen. Now, factors that reduce the affinity of hemoglobin for oxygen include a higher carbon dioxide concentration and a lower pH, but also higher temperatures mean that hemoglobin has a lower affinity. Now we call this the ball effect. When it shifts to the right, that's the ball effect. So if the oxygen dissociation curve moves to the right, it is low affinity hemoglobin. And if it moves to the left, just to recap, it is high affinity hemoglobin. So the ball shift next of all then. Now respiring tissues release CO2 and CO2 forms a weak acid known as carbonic acid in solution. Now that's going to reduce the affinity of hemoglobin and it's really clever, really. It's a great evolutionary adaptation because it means that hemoglobin will unload more oxygen at the respiring tissues. So different organisms next of all. Now this is highlighted in the spec. You need to know how hemoglobin can change in different organisms. Now the hemoglobin in your own body can change its affinity, but you have almost like a genetic set point for the structure of your hemoglobin where it will fluctuate around that range. Now, these organisms have evolved to have a different set point. But remember, if it's at their lungs or if it's at the respiring tissues, it might shift a little bit in terms of its affinity. So let's look at the llama first of all. Now, we've got human hemoglobin on the right, and we can see it's got a relatively lower affinity because it's on the right-hand side. And llama hemoglobin has a higher affinity. Now, that's an adaptation to high altitude where there's less oxygen or a lower partial pressure of oxygen. So they've got a special adaptation, which means we need a smaller increase in partial pressure to generate the same increase in percentage saturation of hemoglobin with oxygen. So it's a fantastic adaptation to make sure that llamas take in oxygen from their environment. Now, lugworms, very similar. They have a much higher affinity hemoglobin than humans because they live in low oxygen environments. And both of these come up in AQA A-level biology questions. Now, next of all, we've got the shrew at the top right. Now, this organism is the opposite to what we've just looked at. Because it's very active, it has a high metabolic rate. And part of the reason the shrew has a high metabolic rate is because it's so small, that means it's got an incredibly high surface area to volume ratio. So it loses heat rapidly. Now we generate heat via the electron transfer chain in aerobic respiration. So basically the shrew wants to be dropping off lots of oxygen at the respiring tissues to provide the substrate needed for aerobic respiration. So in the shrew, it will have hemoglobin with a lower affinity for oxygen. And that's why the curve for the shrew is to the right. So just to sum this up, organisms that live in environments with low oxygen concentrations have high affinity hemoglobin. And very active organisms that have a high rate of aerobic respiration 
have relatively lower affinity hemoglobin. Right, let's dive into the circulatory system next of all. So the circulatory system in mammals is made up of the heart and blood vessels, including arteries, veins, and capillaries. And you need to know about all of these for the A-level exam. The circulatory system increases the rate of exchange of key substances like oxygen, glucose, carbon dioxide, and urea. Now, oxygen and glucose are useful products and carbon dioxide and urea are waste products. Now, this addresses the problem of organisms having a lower surface area to volume ratio as they get larger. Now, that can be quite tricky to get your head around because smaller organisms have a smaller surface area than larger organisms, but larger organisms have a lower surface area to volume ratio. So that means they've got relatively more on the inside compared to the outside. Now, this is a nice diagram showing the circulatory system. We can see we've got the heart in the center that receives oxygenated blood from the lungs, and that will come in through the pulmonary vein. It pumps oxygenated blood to the body through the aorta, it receives deoxygenated blood from the body through the vena cava, and it pumps deoxygenated blood for the lungs to pick up oxygen, and that's through the pulmonary artery. So the heart is the central pump that moves blood around the body. Deoxygenated blood enters the heart through the vena cava. Deoxygenated blood is pumped from the heart to the lungs through the pulmonary artery, and oxygenated blood enters the heart from the lungs through the pulmonary vein. Oxygenated blood is pumped from the heart to the body through the aorta. Now this is the external structure of the heart. And the key thing to note is that we've got the aorta there, which will connect to the left ventricle. We've got the vena cava here, which will connect to the right atrium. We've got the pulmonary artery here, which will connect to the right ventricle. And then we've got the pulmonary veins here, which will connect to the left atria. Now you also need to know the right coronary artery and the left coronary artery there. And that's important because you need to know diseases that can affect them. So the coronary arteries supply the heart with oxygenated blood as well as glucose. Now this is the kidney and it's the next thing you need to know. So the renal artery brings blood to the kidneys. And the way to remember that is at the organs, arteries arrive. The renal vein takes blood away from the kidney. And the way to remember that is that veins vacate the organs. But this is different for the heart, which we'll look at in a moment. Arteries, veins, and capillaries next of all. Now remember, arteries away when we're talking about the heart. So arteries carry blood away from the heart to the body. But if we're talking about an organ that the heart supplies with blood, then arteries arrive. So arteries away for the heart, arteries arrive for all the other organs. Arteries have thick, muscular and elastic walls that can recoil to maintain a high pressure. Arteries branch into smaller arterioles and the inner layer of an artery is called the endothelium. And the endothelium is actually folded and that allows it to recoil out a little bit give it a bit more stretch so it can regulate the pressure of the blood. So let's look at veins next of all. Well, veins carry blood into the heart. So remember veins carry blood into the heart and the word vein has got IN within it, which is a really neat way to remember this. But if we're talking about every other organ apart from the heart, veins vacate, they leave the other organs. Now they carry blood under a much lower pressure than the arteries. So they have an adaptation called valves which prevents backflow. And you can see that in my diagram on the left. The veins carry blood in one direction. And if the flow isn't very strong, the valve will shut and it will keep the blood in place until the heart can beat again. So let's look at capillaries next of all. Now capillaries have an endothelium, remember inner layer, that is one cell thick. And that gives them a really short diffusion pathway for their role of delivering oxygen. Capillaries form large networks called capillary beds, and they provide a very large surface area for exchange, dropping off the oxygen and glucose, taking in the carbon dioxide and urea. And we can see in this diagram here that the endothelium has little gaps in it called fenestrations. And those little pores or gaps 
allow larger molecules to be squeezed out of the capillary walls into the surrounding tissues. So let's have a little look in more detail at how capillaries are adapted for their role as exchange vessels. So first of all, the capillary wall is permeable. That's going to allow substances to pass out so they're delivered. The endothelial cells that make up the capillary wall, as we've said, are one cell fixed. So we've got that nice short diffusion pathway. The endothelial cells are actually flattened. So that's an adaptation of the cell, which again shortens the diffusion pathway. The narrow lumen gives a large surface area to volume ratio, but it also again gives a short diffusion pathway. So I'm sure you can notice a trend here. And this also slows the movement of blood because the red blood cells have to slowly maneuver through the capillaries. And that's going to give more time for diffusion to release oxygen into the tissues and to take in waste products. Now also due to the narrow lumen, red blood cells are pushed, squeezed up against the walls in contact with the capillary wall, given an even shorter diffusion pathway. So it's fantastic the adaptations we have in our circulatory system. Next of all, tissue fluid formation. This is one that often trips students up. So let's nail it now. Now tissue fluid bathes the cells. And if you ever get a little cut and you get some fluid weeping out, which isn't red, that's tissue fluid. It's basically the fluid with all molecules and nutrients dissolved within it, but no red blood cells. And tissue fluid is made up of plasma along with small molecules like oxygen and glucose. Now oxygen and glucose is delivered to the tissue fluid from the capillaries and carbon dioxide and urea are removed from the tissue fluid into the capillaries. Next, at the arterial end of the capillary bed, so on the left-hand side here, and if I just take my pen, this here, I'm just going to put an A there for arterial end. So at the arterial end, there's a high hydrostatic pressure. So tissue fluid is forced out of the capillaries into the surrounding tissues. Now at the venual end, I'll just put a V here for venual end. The pressure is lower because of the fluid loss. So because the hydrostatic pressure is now higher in the surrounding tissues than it is in the capillary, it will move down a pressure gradient back into the capillaries, bringing with it that carbon dioxide and urea. Now the hydrostatic pressure of the capillaries, as we've said, is lower at the venual end, and that's because of the fluid loss that's occurred. The water potential, however, is also lower at the venual end, and that's because there's large soluble proteins that are left behind. So if I just take my pen, I'm going to do, draw some dots there just to represent large soluble proteins in the capillary. Now, obviously, if it's lost fluid and soluble molecules have remained behind, that's going to mean that the water potential is now more negative. So water will move from the tissue fluid back into the capillaries via the process of osmosis. So this means that some water, as I've just said, re-enters the capillaries via osmosis, but that is worth restating because it will pick you up valuable marks in the exam. Finally, the lymph system collects any excess tissue fluid and returns it to the blood. And we can see the lymphatic vessel here. Now the blood will re-enter the heart through the vena cava. So when we say deoxygenated blood goes up through to the right atria from the vena cava, this is where it comes from. So next of all, the structure of the heart. So you need to know all about the left and right atrium, the left and right ventricle. So we've got the bicuspid on the left. So this atrioventricular valve here is the bicuspid. And on the right-hand side, we've got the tricuspid. Now they're called atrioventricular valves because they separate the atrium from the ventricle. Here, we've got our semilunar valves, which we can see at the base of the pulmonary artery and the base of the aorta. So blood on the left-hand side is going to come in through the pulmonary vein into the left atrium, from the left atrium through the bicuspid into the left ventricle, from the left ventricle through the semilunar valve into the aorta and the aorta to the body. Now on the right side, we're going to have blood coming in through the vena cava to the right atrium. It will go through the tricuspid to the right ventricle. It will then go through the semilunar valve to the pulmonary artery and from the pulmonary artery 
it will go to the lungs to pick up oxygen. Now the left ventricle has thicker muscle than the right as it needs to pump blood all around the body. The ventricles have thicker muscle than the atria, so both ventricles have thicker muscle than the atria. And that's because the atria doesn't have to pump blood as far. And the atria are also actually assisted by gravity. So when you do a dissection of the heart in required practical five, you'll notice that the muscle of the atria is very flimsy and thin, whereas the muscle of the ventricles is thicker because they need to generate more force, more pressure to pump blood over larger distances. But remember, the left ventricle has the thickest muscle of all. Now, the atrioventricular valves prevent backflow into the atria. So remember, we've got the bicuspid on the left and the tricuspid on the right. The semilunar valves prevent backflow into the ventricles. Now let's have a closer look at the cardiac cycle. So step one, we have atrial systole. And in during atrial systole, we have the atria contracting, which we can see at the top here. We can just see the groove in the side of the atria there. And that's going to open the atrioventricular valve. So it'll open the bicuspid and the tricuspid. The ventricles will remain relaxed while they fill up with blood and the semilunar valves remain closed. Step two, the ventricles contract, and this is known as ventricular systole. So the ventricles contract, and we can see there that they've reduced in size, so they're generating pressure there. The atria then relax, so they're nice and relaxed at the top. The atrioventricular valves are going to shut because the pressure in the ventricles is higher than the atria. And the semilunar valves remain closed for the first part of this, but eventually when the pressure in the ventricles is greater than the arteries, the semilunar valves then open in step three. Now in step four, the ventricles then relax and we call that ventricular diastole. The atria will be relaxing and filling. So the whole heart will be relaxed. The atrioventricular valves will remain closed and the semilunar valves will close behind the blood that was loaded into them. And finally, the ventricles are fully relaxed, the atria are fully filled up now, and basically the atrioventricular valves will pop open as the atria are full up and the pressure is increased in the atria relative to the ventricles, and the whole cycle will repeat again. Now, I want you to be really confident on this. I want you to be able to say that if there's a greater pressure in the atria, that will open the atrioventricular valves. If there's a greater pressure in the ventricle, that will open the semilunar valves. And really talk about this cycle in terms of valve opening and pressure changes. So let's have a look at the cardiac cycle in terms of data next of all. So step one, we've got the atrial pressure increasing due to atrial contraction, which is known as atrial systole. So we can see here with this orange line here, the atrial pressure increases as the atria contract. Now at this point, the atrioventricular valves will open and the ventricles will fill up with blood. Now number two, the ventricular pressure increases due to the contraction and that will close the atrioventricular valves below them. So we can see here, just as this green line emerges above the orange line, so the ventricular pressure just gets a little bit higher than the atrial pressure, that's going to close our atrioventricular valves. And then the ventricular pressure is going to increase because of that ventricular contraction. And we can see here at the point when the green line exceeds the pressure in the aorta, that's when the semilunar valves will open because the pressure is greater in the ventricle, opening that semilunar valve. So it will, the semilunar valve will only open when that green ventricular pressure is above the red. Okay. Now, aortic pressure increases as blood flows into the aorta and it all leaves the ventricles. Now, when pressure is higher in the aorta than the ventricles, the semilunar valves will shut. And we can see there, just when that red line peaks above the green ventricular pressure, so when the aortic pressure peaks above the ventricular pressure, the semilunar valves are going to snap shut behind them. And remember, the aorta doesn't need to contract because blood can only flow in one direction. So the valves will shut like a trap door underneath the blood that the ventricles have just pushed into the aorta. Now the ventricular pressure will decrease during ventricular relaxation. And we can see that here where I've got my cursor. 
And finally, the atria will fill. So the pressure in the atria increases as the atria fill. And that's going to open the atrioventricular valve. So only when that orange line is peaked above the green line there, it's going to open the atrioventricular valves and the whole cycle will repeat again. Now, this is happening in your chest 60 to 80 times per minute while I'm talking to you. And we can see we've got the lub dub sound. So if you've ever listened to someone's chest with a stethoscope, the lub is when the atrioventricular valve snaps shut and the dub is when the semilunar valves snap shut. So let's look at cardiovascular disease next of all. So an aphroma is a fatty deposit in the artery wall. And we can see an aphroma here in this artery building up under the inner layer of that artery. Now this is going to increase the blood pressure because it's narrowing the artery and minerals can deposit in the aphroma forming plaques like the plaque on teeth which will weaken the arterial wall because if we've got this hard tough structure in the artery the artery is soft it's going to cause damage to the artery lining now aphromas increase the risk of an aneurysm and an aneurysm is a balloon-like swelling of the artery but it also, an aphroma also increases the formation of blood clots. And the formation of blood clots is scientifically known as thrombosis. So with cardiovascular disease then, when an aphroma plaque damages the endothelium, the inner wall of an artery, platelets and fibrin could form a blood clot. Now, the scientific name for a blood clot is a thrombus. And we can see that happening here. So we've got this nice normal artery there. Then we've got this plaque forming in the artery wall. We've got this fibrin and platelets, and platelets are like bashed up dead red blood cells. And we can see there that we've got a blood clot, and it's going to stop the flow of blood. Now, your blood clotting is really important in healthy people to stop bleeding, but we don't want it to happen within arteries. That's very dangerous. Now, if this thrombus becomes dislodged, it can then go further down the, the cardiovascular system and block the coronary arteries we looked at earlier. And this can lead to a myocardial infarction, which is basically a heart attack. If the aphroma plaque weakens and damages the artery wall, it can lead to a balloon-like swelling called an aneurysm. And this is quite a graphic image here, but basically we can see that artery there ballooning out because it's weakened and it's just kind of expanded out. Now that can burst and that can lead to a hemorrhage which is bleeding within the body. So what are the risk factors for cardiovascular disease then? And how can we prevent it? Because someone dies in America due to heart disease around every 30 to 40 seconds. So it's a really serious disease. So the first risk factor is smoking. Now nicotine increases blood pressure. So that's gonna to lead to an increased risk of aphroma and aneurysm and all that stuff. Carbon monoxide also joins with hemoglobin and prevents it from carrying oxygen. Now, next of all, poor diet. So if we have loads of cholesterol, particularly low density lipoproteins, that can lead to the formation of aphromas and therefore blood clots and high blood pressure. Now, LDLs are the unhealthy type of cholesterol that deposit fat in the wall of arteries. There's another type called HDLs, and I always think H for healthy because they remove fat from the walls of arteries. Now, additionally, excessive salt can increase blood pressure and therefore put people at more risk from developing an aneurysm. Now, high blood pressure, last of all, now that increases the risk of damage to the arterial endothelium and therefore aphroma. Aphromas can lead to blood clots and that increases the risk of a heart attack, which is a myocardial infarction. Now, when those coronary arteries are blocked, that means oxygen and glucose can't reach the, the vital muscle of the heart and it starts to die in the patient's chest. So it's a really serious disease. Now, there are some things which aren't necessarily preventable that you need to be aware of. So you can have a family history of heart disease and be genetically predisposed to developing this disease. Gender, so males are more likely to suffer from it than females. Now, lack of exercise is preventable, but it can also risk the development of CVD or cardiovascular disease. And also, as an individual increases in age, they're more at risk from CVD. So let's put all this together with some exam practice now.
So we've got a comprehension question here, which comes at the end of paper one. So describe and explain how the structure of a capillary adapts it for the exchange of substances between the blood and surrounding tissues. And that's worth five marks. So pause the video, have a go at the question now, guys, and we'll check out the answer. So the answer is one mark for saying permeable capillary walls or membranes. Flattened endothelial cells reduce the diffusion distance. A third way to get a mark is for mentioning the fenestrations that allow large molecules through. So they're the pores in the capillary wall. You could get a mark for saying single cell thick or thin walls reduce the diffusion distance. A small diameter or a narrow diameter gives a large surface area to volume ratio, or you could also say a short diffusion distance for that mark point. Next, a narrow lumen reduces the rate of blood flow, allowing more time for diffusion to take place. And a final way to get a mark is to say that red blood cells are pressed up against capillary walls, meaning again, a shorter diffusion pathway. So question two next of all, explain how the formation of tissue fluid takes place and how it is returned to the circulatory system. So pause the video and we'll go through the answer. So the answer is, first mark, a higher hydrostatic pressure is found at the arterial end. Next, water soluble molecules pass out with the fluid. Next, proteins remain behind. A fourth way to get a mark is for saying these proteins lower the water potential or the water potential becomes more negative. So water moves back into the venual end of the capillary by osmosis or diffusion. Now remember with the fenestrations, there's little pores in the capillary walls. So some water doesn't need to cross cell membranes and therefore can move via simple diffusion. But if it moves through a cell membrane, it's always defined as osmosis. And finally, the lymph system collects any excess tissue fluid and returns it to the blood or the veins. Or you could say the vena cava is a bigger example. Right then, guys, that's everything we've got time for today. I really hope you got some use from it. If you did, please like, comment and subscribe. And I'll get another video out to you soon. Take care, guys.